In the science fiction television series Stargate SG-1 and its sequels, several types of starships are introduced in the later seasons. In the series, they are the product of several years' worth of research into alien technologies discovered on off-world missions to other planets visited via the Stargate. The Stargate is an alien device discovered on Earth that allows near-instantaneous travel to other planets via a controlled wormhole across a network of similar gates. The Stargate was created by an extinct race called the Ancients, but are in use by aliens, some of which use both Stargate and Starship travel. Some of these alien races are hostile to Earth and bent on galaxy-wide domination, so Earth starships are built by the U.S. military through billions of dollars in secret funding to respond to the threat. After several prototype models, including some failures, Earth begins constructing its own space-capable fighters and larger, mothership-style vessels. The primary source of inspiration for the early models is scavenged Goaud technology, which is later replaced with entirely Earth-made components as they gain the expertise to fabricate the materials. The plans for these vessels are shared with the Russians as part of the deal to use their Stargate. The first successful ship fielded by Earth is the F 302, a small, two man craft somewhat similar to a traditional human fighter aircraft, but capable of spaceflight and interstellar travel. F 302s are the standard dogfighting attacker used by the Stargate program. Later on, Earth begins creating interstellar battlecruisers, the first of which is the Prometheus. While the F-302 is generally a match for a go-out death glider and in some ways is superior, Earth battlecruisers are at first inferior to the equivalent vessels of other races. In the SG-1 finale, unending. The Asgard provide Earth with technology that closes this gap, making Earth ships some of the most powerful vessels in the series. Topic X three hundred and one. The X three hundred and one fighter interceptor is Earth's first attempt at building a fighter capable of space travel and orbital defense against the Goaud. It is featured in the episode Tangent. The X three hundred and one is constructed in Area fifty one from a combination of Earth components and parts salvaged from two Goaud death gliders from the Apophis motherships. The X-301 is equipped with a go-out inertial propulsion system capable of nullifying any G-force on pilot, stealth technology that hides it from radar, and two Nakada-enhanced AIM-120 AMRAAM air-to-air missiles. It was mentioned that they would be effective against the Goaud mother ships if armed with shield modulators, however, no missiles fired by Earth ships were ever seen to penetrate through Goaud shields, so they may never have had that form of technology working, and it was only mentioned in reference to the X-301, not the 302. The first test flight is conducted by Jack O'Neill and Teal'c, with the call sign, Digger 1. The test almost proves fatal when an undiscovered booby trap planted by Apophis activates and launches the ship towards open space and towards Chulak, the home world of Apophis. O'Neill and Teal'c are rescued just before their life support runs out by Jacob Carter in a go-out cargo ship. <laughs> F-302 The F-302 multi-role fighter is the production model of the X-302 experimental fighter, first seen in the season 6 premiere. 
Redemption Based on the X-301 but entirely human-built, the F-302 is a multi-role two-person craft with four sets of engines, two traditional jet engines, two aerospike engines, one rocket motor, and a Nakadriya-based hyperspace window generator. Due to the instability of the Nakadriya, the ship's hyperspace generator is only capable of short, unguided jumps. The craft is fitted with an inertial damping system that allows it to achieve orbit, although they are only 90% effective when pulling negative Gs. F-302s are evidently capable of V, S T O L, as demonstrated by two F-302s escorting a Wraith Scout ship to a landing pad on Atlantis in the Stargate Atlantis episode, Allies. The F-302's main armaments are modified Nakada enhanced AIM-120 AMRAAM air-to-air -air missiles. They are also armed with railguns. The X-302 prototype is used in Redemption to carry the Stargate a safe distance away from Earth before it explodes. The first F-302 combat mission takes place in Fallen where one is flown by Colonel Jack O'Neill and Major Samantha Carter in a strike against Anubis mothership. In the episode, ''Lost City'', several squadrons of F-302s commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Cameron Mitchell accompany the Prometheus in defending SG-1's cargo ship against Anubis force of Al-Kesh and Death Gliders. F-302 squadrons are assigned to almost all of Earth's outposts, as well as Earth itself, the Prometheus could carry eight F-302s. F-302s have had various call signs, including, Air Strike, Flight, Blue Leader, Delta 1-4, and Dagger 1-2. The first SFW, Snake Skinners, is a wing of F-302s in the Milky Way, and the first TFW, Wraithwaxes, is based on the Daedalus. The X-302s have had the call signs Abydos 1 and Starflight. In Season 8, Martin Wood and Brad Wright accepted an invitation by the United States Air Force to go on a test ride in the trainer jets. Set designer Peter Bodnaris based the design of the F-302 on the F-117A U.S. Air Force stealth fighter and the HL-10 aircraft from the 1970s, while still leaving the go-out glider origins of the design recognizable. He and his team focused on creating a realistic-looking cockpit interior for the X-302 in terms of the headrest with overhead ejection handles and emergency systems. <laughs> Prometheus Prometheus, also known as the BC-303 or the X-303 early in development, is Earth's first capital starship, introduced in the Season 6 episode, Prometheus. The original concept for the look of the Prometheus in Season 6 was an aircraft carrier. The producers wanted to build something that was exactly the opposite of go-out ships, which, according to Paul Mully, are basically big empty rooms with nowhere to sit, no screens and no buttons to press. Andy Mikita thought the Prometheus was a fun set to shoot in because, "...there's lots of layers and textures and flashing lights." Much of the inspiration for the X-303's interior came from contemporary American aircraft carriers. Bridget McGuire developed the initial concept based on pictures. P. 
Peter Bodnaris developed the blueprints of the X-303 that were shown in Nightwalkers before the X-303 made its first appearance in Prometheus. Art director James Robbins developed the interior schematics and interior workings, while Bodnaris developed the actual set interiors including the bridge, corridors, engine room and air lock, a hybrid of human and alien technologies. The Prometheus is the product of two years and several billion dollars worth of development by the United States Air Force. The ship originally features mostly reverse-engineered go-out technologies, including ring transporters and crystal-based control systems. It is also equipped with artificial gravity generators and an inertial dampening system. The corridors are constructed of the fictional metal trinium. Substantial amounts of nakada are also used in its construction. In Disclosure. The Asgard install advanced shields and weapons, though the latter are withheld on the unfinished Prometheus as thanks for SG-1's help against the replicators. In Covenant, Jack O'Neill asks Thor for a new hyperdrive for the Prometheus, which is installed by the Asgard in Endgame, along with beaming technology. However, since the Prometheus lacks advanced Asgard sensors, locator beacons are required to lock onto targets. The sublight engines of the Prometheus have a top speed of 110,000 miles per second, 59% light speed, and can attain orbit from Earth's surface in under 30 seconds. Its original hyperdrive cost $2 billion in research and development and uses Nakadraya as a power source. A buffer was installed to manage the unstable power stream from the Nakadraya, but it is overloaded by an unexpected gravity wave on the Prometheus shakedown cruise. The ship is then fitted with a hyperdrive salvaged from a go-out Alkesh, but as that engine is designed for a much smaller ship, the Prometheus can only make short jumps with time in between for the drive to cool down. With the new Asgard hyperdrive installed in Endgame, the Prometheus is able to reach other galaxies. The Prometheus is armed with 24 rail guns, a close-in weapons system, and 16 missile batteries. It carries eight F-302s for fighter support. In its first appearance, the incomplete Prometheus is hijacked by rogue NID agents and subsequently called upon by the Asgard for a mission against the replicators. In Memento. The Prometheus, commanded by Colonel William Ronson, is temporarily stranded near Tagria after its hyperdrive overloads. In Grace, the Prometheus is attacked by an unknown enemy warship and almost becomes trapped after hiding in an unusual nebula. Under the command of General George Hammond, the Prometheus defends Earth against Anubis Armada in Lost City. The ship is subsequently commanded by Colonel Lionel Pendergast, except in Prometheus Unbound, when Hammond briefly reassumes command. In that episode, Valor Maldoran hijacks the Prometheus, stranding the crew in a disabled Alkesh. Under Pendergast, the Prometheus conducts missions against Baal and the Trust, and against the Ori. In Ethan, the Prometheus is destroyed by a satellite weapon of Ori design over Tegalus. The last appearance of the ship is in an alternate universe in The Road Not Taken, where it serves as the equivalent of Air Force One for President Hank Landry. Daedalus class 
The Daedalus class battlecruiser, also called a deep space carrier and a 304, is the second generation of Earth battlecruiser, designed to fully integrate the various alien technologies that were tacked on to the Prometheus over its life. The first ship of this class, the Daedalus, appears in the Stargate Atlantis episode, The Siege, Part 3. The construction of Daedalus class ships is a top priority for the United States. In the Stargate SG 1 episode, The Ties That Bind, the Senate Appropriations Committee diverts 70% of the SGC's funding to 304 construction. The bridge of the Daedalus class is at the rear of the ship along the top of the hull. There are two hangar bays, each with room to accommodate eight F-302s. The hangars have force shields to prevent decompression when the doors are open. The Daedalus class contains technology reverse engineered from the Goaud, such as ring transporters. It also has beaming technology, shields, and intergalactic hyperdrives provided by the Asgard. The hyperdrive of the Daedalus class allows it to cross the 3 million light years between Earth and Atlantis in 18 days. If powered by a ZPM, it can cover the same distance in four days. The ship carries Mark III and Mark VIII tactical nuclear warheads and 32 railguns. The Daedalus and the Apollo have only been depicted to launch missiles dorsally, while the Odyssey is shown with ventral emplacements in "...family ties." In "...the Siege, Part 3," Hermiode overrides the safeguards on the Daedalus beaming technology, allowing it to be used as a weapons delivery system. In "...unending." The Asgard, about to become extinct, install their most powerful technologies on the Odyssey. Chief among these enhancements are powerful plasma beam weapons, stronger shields, and an advanced self-powered computer core. The other 304s are eventually equipped with these technologies. A computer core was installed on Daedalus and the Phoenix on the bridge and possibly the other 304s, as well. With these enhancements, the Daedalus class is shown to be a match for ancient, Wraith and Ori warships. <laughs> Named ships During the run of Stargate SG-1, Stargate Atlantis and Stargate Universe, six Daedalus-class ships are known to have been built not including two alternate timeline ships. They are distinguishable by their distinctive interior lighting, notably the lighting of the bridge and the back lighting for the tactical map behind the commander's chair. The Prometheus and Korolev are white and purple, respectively. The Odyssey is orange, and the Apollo is blue. While the Daedalus is green, its counterpart from the Daedalus Variations has a distinctive orange map, a deliberate ploy according to Alan McCullough. As featured in the alternative timeline, The Last Man. The Phoenix has no map and has an Asgard console in its place. USS Daedalus The USS Daedalus is introduced in the Stargate Atlantis Season 2 premiere, The Siege, Part 3. It is commanded by Colonel Stephen Caldwell and initially carries an Asgard engineer, Hermiode. The Daedalus arrives at Atlantis carrying a ZPM recovered in Mobius and helps to fend off a Wraith attack. The Daedalus becomes a recurring element in Stargate Atlantis, making regular trips between Atlantis and Earth, such as in The Intruder, Trinity, and Critical Mass. The Daedalus battles the Wraith in The Hive and «No Man's Land», 
the assurance in Be All My Sins Remembered and Michael in The Kindred and Search and Rescue. The ship is also mentioned in several Stargate SG-1 episodes, including Avalon, where it is due to transport Daniel Jackson to Atlantis, and The Shroud, where it unblocks the Ori Super Gate for a mission against the Ori. In The Daedalus Variations, the Atlantis team encounters a Daedalus from another reality equipped with an alternate reality drive, which allows the ship jump to parallel universes. In Enemy at the Gate, the Daedalus is crippled following an engagement with a ZPM powered hive ship. USS Odyssey The USS Odyssey registry PB3865 first appears in the Stargate SG-1 Season 9 episode, Off the Grid, having been rushed into service to rescue the SG-1 team from the Lucian Alliance. With the Prometheus destroyed in Ethan. The Odyssey becomes Earth's first line of defense, and is later equipped with a ZPM left behind by the Assurance in The Return. The Odyssey survives the battle against the Ori in Camelot, and supports SG-1 in several episodes including Counter-Strike, The Scourge, and Dominion in the Pegasus Project. The Odyssey conducts a mission in the Pegasus Galaxy to seal the Ori Super Gate between the Ori Galaxy and the Milky Way Galaxy. In Company of Thieves, the Odyssey is briefly taken over by the Lucian Alliance, which results in the death of its first commander, Colonel Paul Emerson. Emerson is succeeded by Colonel Davidson. In The Shroud, Daniel Jackson with Merlin's knowledge modifies the Odyssey with the ability to cloak and uses it as part of his plan to deliver the Sangral to the Ori Galaxy. The Odyssey travels to the Asgard homeworld Arilla in Unending, where it is upgraded with the latest Asgard technologies. In Stargate, The Ark of Truth, the Odyssey is temporarily commanded by Lieutenant Colonel Cameron Mitchell on a mission to find the Ark of Truth in the Ori Galaxy. During the attempted Wraith assault on Earth in the Atlantis series finale, Enemy at the Gate, the Odyssey is carrying out an unknown mission which even Colonel Caldwell is not supposed to know about. RFS Korolev The RFS Korolev named after the Soviet space engineer Sergei Korolev is given to Russia by the United States in the Stargate SG-1 Season 9 episode, Crusade, in return for allowing Stargate Command to continue using the Russian Stargate. Commanded by Colonel Chekhov, the Korolev picks up Daniel Jackson and Cameron Mitchell from Camelot en route to a confrontation with Ori motherships at P3Y229 in Camelot. The Korolev is destroyed in the ensuing battle. The Odyssey is able to beam only six crew members aboard, while Jackson escapes using a ring transporter and Mitchell in an F302. USS Apollo The USS Apollo, commanded by Colonel Abe Ellis and assigned to the second tactical wing, first appears in the Stargate Atlantis Season 3 finale, First Strike. Its mission is to destroy the warships under construction on the Asuran homeworld, using the Horizon Weapons Platform. In Adrift and Lifeline. The Apollo searches for Atlantis after the city fails to arrive at its new planet, and rescues John Shepard's team from the Assurance. In Be All My Sins Remembered, 
The Apollo and the Daedalus engage the Asuran fleet and participate in the plan to eliminate the replicators once and for all. In Outcast, the Apollo assists in the hunt for a rogue human form replicator on Earth. In Stargate, The Ark of Truth, which takes place before Season 4 of Atlantis, the Apollo monitors the approach of an Ori fleet. In Enemy at the Gate, following an engagement with an Earth bound ZPM powered hive ship, the Apollo is heavily damaged and left crippled with no functional hyperdrive. USS George Hammond, formerly the Phoenix, the Phoenix first appears in the alternate future of the Stargate Atlantis season 4 episode, The Last Man, where it is given to Colonel Samantha Carter to battle the forces of the Wraith Michael. The Phoenix is eventually mentioned in the normal timeline in Enemy at the Gate where it is still under construction and has been renamed USS George Hammond in honor of General George Hammond who died off-screen of a heart attack Don S. Davis, who played Hammond, died in this way. The ship is commanded by Colonel Carter in the premiere of Stargate Universe, where the ship is shown in orbit of Icarus base under attack by Haytack vessels. The Hammond later attempts to aid Rush when he tries to infiltrate the Lucian Alliance, but due to jammers is unable to beam him aboard and is unable to catch the Lucian cargo ship that escapes. After learning the location of the Lucian Alliance base from Telford, the Hammond is dispatched to rescue Rush and take control of the base. The Hammond's attack forces the Alliance to dial Destiny early, causing the planet to explode. Rush is taken through the Stargate to Destiny while the Hammond is forced to flee without two of her F-302s due to a lack of time to retrieve them. The Hammond's attack on the planet causes its destruction and the death of over 100 Lucian Alliance soldiers, eliminating more than two-thirds of the invasion force and allowing the Destiny crew to eventually overcome the rest. Sun Tzu The Sun Tzu is introduced in Enemy at the Gate. After engaging a ZPM-powered hive ship on course for Earth, the Sun Tzu is said to have been crippled and venting atmosphere. According to executive producer Joseph Malotzi, the ship belongs to the Chinese government, and is a Daedalus-class ship. See also List of starships in Stargate